Good morning. Come on, I think we can do a bit better than that. I know there's still a lot of noisy people out there, but good morning. How oh, yeah, there we go. So, James Haken, welcome back. I'm absolutely delighted to be helping you through this afternoon. And our first panel back is talking all things third-party operators. So, put your hand up if you're involved in any way in hotel food and beverage, whether that's placing food and beverage, consulting, operating, few of you, quite a few of you I know who are, just aren't bothering to put your hands up, but that's all good. How about any of you who are involved in third-party operators? few of you out there? Yeah, a few more again, just can't be bothered, but that's fine, we'll work it through. So uh, we're going to talk a little bit about this. Let me bring on our panel. We're going to bring on Tobias Schultz from Hilton. How are you come, Tobias? Been told that we're... <laughs> Nick Carmody from Ennismore, and Nayan Madad from Gates Hospitality. Really there was a bit of a debate backstage on who was sitting where, but I think that we're, uh, we might be there, but who knows. So, without further ado, we're going to get straight into this, and maybe we'll start at your end, Tobias. A very quick introduction to you. I guess we don't really need Hilton uh, explained as a business, but your role within it and the scope. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. So, my name is Tobias. I look after all of Hilton's restaurant and bar partnerships across Europe, Middle East, and Africa. And uh, I've been doing this work for the last 15 years, six of those across Asia Pacific, a uh, couple of years in the Middle East and also in Europe. So I've really worked across different um, cultural segments and really great to be on this panel. And over to you, Nick. Yeah, good morning. I'm Nick Comati. I'm the Vice President of Food and Beverage for Ennismore for the region of uh, Middle East, Africa, Turkey and India. Uh, doing both development and operations, oversee the operation of our properties is throughout the, that region and the development of multiple properties coming up. Cool. And last but not least. <laughs> Morning, everyone. Now you Madad, Chief Executive and Founder of Gates Hospitality, operating in um, the UAE, Oman, Central London and Australia, food and beverage, uh, holistic wellness and resorts and spas. Thank you. Thank you all, and thanks for joining us today. Unfortunately, uh, Lynn, who was meant to be here, hasn't been able to make it just due to uh, a challenge around being ill today, but uh, she's here in spirit, I'm sure. So we're going to get really started talking a little bit about the breadth uh, of what third-party operators can do. And I think it's interesting, if we rewind back 15, even a decade ago, I guess that there was such a focus on named celebrity chefs. That's what people would have been thinking about if we were up here. It strikes me that that's come a long, long way in the last decade or so. And there's such diverse diversity in the types of operators, the types of brands, and I think we're really seeing a hugely varied uh, opportunity for hoteliers and asset managers, and also on the flip side from an operator standpoint. I guess in terms of that change, it would really be interesting to see where you think that that change has come most, and also what you think those key motivators have been to really get to the current position that we're sitting within. Maybe we'll start on this end this time of name. Thanks, James. Uh, look, it's market maturity, I, I guess. It's, it's really, in a way, to, to summarize the, uh, the, the progress and, and the uh, level where we are at. Uh, the, the city itself, or the country itself, has evolved rapidly, and I think food and beverage has been a part of that success story without a shadow. Um, today, we are importing brands out of the UAE elsewhere, and five, eight years ago, we were actually export, importing, I beg your pardon, uh, into the country. So, a, a lot has shifted. The uh, maturity in the marketplace from consumers, from operators, from um, knowledge and know-how is, is really evolved very quickly, has, has been a, a capitalist in, in, in many fronts, and uh, I think it'll only continue on moving forward. Um, it's been a, a directive from the, from the leadership of the country to say, uh, hospitality hospitality, tourism, uh, food and beverage is, is really a part of the mix. It's an essential part of the uh, success of a, of a hotel. It complements what uh, the hoteliers do. And last but not least, it's a main uh, contributor to the economy from, a, from an owner's perspective, from a positioning of a, of a brand UAE, brand Dubai. It's, it's been nothing short of a success story. That's great, thank you. Nick, you said you've been in the region for what, eight years in Dubai. So within that time, you'll have seen a lot of this change. And of course, in your current role, are helping towards making that an even greater change. What, what's your view here? 
100 percent. I think, you know, what, what I mentioned is right on point. And what we strongly believe is that FNB is really a regional aspect. So, you know, each region and each country sometimes has a very, you know, diversified FNB offering that's really linked to that. So, you know, if you look at Saudi Arabia, and the, our approach in Saudi Arabia is completely different than our approach in the UAE, which is obviously very different than, you know, when we do our hotels and restaurants in London and, or in Europe. So, I think that aspect is very important to understand and to really focus on that. Uh, I think, you know, as mentioned, the market has matured in enormously in the past at least eight years that I've been here, but in the past 15, 20 years, uh, years and I think, you know, today a, you cannot not understand the, the market, the local market, and, and be part of that at, and try to come in and think that you're going to actually make an impact. You know, I think it's, it's very specific, it's very difficult, and, you know, you need to, to have a good uh, uh, mindset in order to, to achieve it. I'm going to you, Tobias. One of the things that I guess I'm quite interested in is that, of course, we know the change has happened. I think both, both gentlemen here have been great explaining that change. But do you think that that change has come about? You sit in this kind of middle space between the brand, the asset <laughs> owner, the operator. I mean, you're kind of sitting in all three. Who do you think has driven this change most? Is it, is it financially driven? Is it experience driven? Like, where has that come from? Look, I think part of the change is driven by the consumer in the market, right? Because if you look at uh, what Rizwan shared, was Gustavo shared with us, there is a huge interest in having third, partner or third parties in hotels and, and work with partners who have built this database of clients. And we should not underestimate that. The database, for me, is one of the key aspects of the success behind restaurant groups like Rika's Group, Sunset Hospitality. For years, they have built a large database that allows them to tap into clients that they bring from one venue to the other venue, and they've built trust. And I've seen this in Asia for many years. Trust factor plays a huge important role. So if you look at our position, for example, as hoteliers, and uh, us wanting to bring in uh, external brands, we look at bringing in databases that come along with those brands. I think that's an important factor. On the other hand, uh, to the other points that were mentioned earlier, of course, owners play a significant role because they want to drive the value of their assets. By bringing in external brands, you can drive the value, you bring external guests, you don't only rely on your in-house guests, but you create experience for customers to come to your property, which put the properties really on the mind map of the city and, and the cityscape. So I think that's a very important aspect. That's really great. Can I jump in? Yeah, jump in. To, going back to your question, who, who's helped that? It's, it's really ownership and, and the return on investment. It's um, clearly, I think, hoteliers as operators are amazing at filling hotel guest rooms. Uh, food and beverage is, is a service that they see to actually service the guests in the, in the hotels rather than developing communities, developing a scene of food and beverage, and developing a vibe in the city. So I think the vibe that has been driven and has been really thought out is, is by operators like Gates Hospitality, like Rizwan's, like the Solutions, the Sunset guys, who have clearly understood the market and went into a market that is very well defined and provided solutions for the residents and the hotel guests alike. Delivering higher returns for the, for the owning companies, delivering positioning of the city uh, F&B scene, and last but not least, opening channels uh, of, of market interest from global interest to, to all of the chefs globally today, they want to be here if they're not here. You have Michelin, who's already in this part of the world. You have Gourmilo, who's already part of this world. Uh, 50 Best, who... This is purely based on the back of how the city has evolved food and beverage with the interest of independent operators, hotel owners' support, in order to make sure that we look at a hotel building saying, let's make sure every corner of the hotel is being sweated, every asset uh, inch is being sweated, and making sure that we're talking to communities, neighborhoods, as well as hotel guests, and making sure that the, get, the, the guests in the hotel, when they go to the concierge, they don't get sent out to Zuma or LPM, they get sent out to a hotel restaurant within the parameters that is equally as vibrant and noisy and delivering quality standards. Add some hotel operator to you. I can't hear. <laughs> Add some hotel <laughs> operator to, to, to what you just said. I think on that basis, though, I mean, it's interesting. I mean, your view there is it's asset-driven and that 
you know, there may be all of these other benefits, but ultimately it's a, it's a commercial, commercial financial return for the asset manager that's driven it. I'm not sure I necessarily disagree, but I guess there's two hotel companies. What's your view on the... Is there a pressure from the asset owners towards you guys to either deliver or they'll find somebody else to deliver on that space? Or is it much more combined? Yeah. yeah. I'll start. Well, with us, it's a little bit different because, you know, we operate a lot of our restaurants, right? Uh, right now in the region, we operate all our restaurants uh, or we'll do some joint ventures. So, you know, once we sign those agreements with the owners, they know that they're coming on board for that aspect. And I think, the, you know, we try to take that from the first day. And that's, the, the, I think, the essential component is when you take an asset that's already existing and, and you have no say into, you know, which restaurant you, uh, are there, how many, the, how many are they, how big are they, then, of course, you're not going to be successful. Well, you know, I think the, the difference with all those independent groups is that they actually go and pick their locations. They will not take any given location just for the sake of taking a location, which hotel operators are a little bit different in, in that sense where we're stuck a little bit with, you know, the asset itself. So, you know... For us to be taking part in those discussions since day one with the owners, uh, having those discussions about F&B, understanding that, you know what, maybe we don't need 11 restaurants in, in one hotel. Well, two, three uh, that are doing actually quite well are actually more sufficient than, than 11 uh, with one working. Thing. And, you know, having all of those, those discussions since the, the beginning is really, I think, the key element to, to, to make it successful. So are you saying, what I'm hearing you say is that it's really easy with new properties, but legacy, you're screwed. <laughs> no, it's not, it's not always the case, but I think, you know, I think that discussion when it comes to, to new properties is, is, is essential. And with, you know, with, with existing ones, is, uh, you know, trying to see how can we think outside of the box, also how can we can add elements. And again, you know, 25 Hours was a great example that uh, brought in by, by Rizwan. We did not design everything from, from day one yet. We came in and we really, you know, try to bring outside of the box ideas, try to bring some partners on certain components. But you know, while still maintaining the, the full operation of uh, the F&B, and I, th I think as well, if we can add to this, I think it's also the importance to have the dialogue with owners, to to have a you know collaboration approach, right? I I don't think that the that that it's only about new assets. If you look at the older properties, we should have the responsibility that we look at what is performing well and what has an opportunity to improve. If I look at some of the projects we have worked on in cities like London. We really looked into details on the numbers and then said, look, here's an opportunity to bring an external brand because we know, and, and goes back to a bit what Gustavo said in Foresight, we have studied the market, we understand what the dynamics are, and it allows us to improve performance. And I think what I've seen over the time in working with our developers, there's a huge interest from owners to bring in third parties if it makes commercial sense. I think it's... It, it, that's really the important aspect. What is the accessibility of the space? Uh, what is the commercial value? What is the contract duration? So those are key elements that play a large role. But there's still owners out there that might have different focus in, in saying, look, my attention is currently not shifted towards food and beverage, and we're trying to educate them and change it. But I think there's both sides. When you're saying some owners out there, I get the sense being involved in this sector that it's still a broad amount of asset managers and owners who are still, as Naeem said, very focused on rooms. And this is second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth down the list. I mean, what's the, what's the point of convincing somebody that this is a good idea? Is it about the return on the space? Or is it actually about creating a heartbeat for the hotel and increasing rooms, room revenue, ADR? What, where are we sitting? I think it's a combination of all of those factors, right? You can't just link it to one specific factor of, of your ADR. You have to link it to experiences. You have to link it to the overall image of your hotel. Uh, I think that's very important. I think the positioning of your hotel, the marketing, the, you know, the marketing that it generates, it's coming from the restaurants that are actually buzzing, right? So you have those guests coming there. If you're a resident of whatever city that, uh, that you're going to those restaurants, guess what? When a friend of yours coming to, to visit, you're going to tell him, you know what? You should stay at 25 hours. It's a great property. I've been there a few times, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so, you know, so it's all those factors that sometimes are intangibles or not really easy to, to say, yes, a room will bring you 
double the, the, the ROI and double the, the GOP on, uh, the, than a restaurant and with much, much less headaches to, to, to operate and to manage it. But I think you know, it's all the extra revenues and all the extra PR marketing that you get out of that that, uh, that adds a lot of value. I started talking about positioning as we, uh, as we started this discussion. And the second topic that I really would like to um, kind of zoom in on is, is positioning. This is about positioning. So I think if you take the overall building, hotel, asset, whatever it is, and you supplement, complement what you have to feed the overall positioning of the hotel, that's a success factor. It's not necessarily commercial only. It's about how do you create a vibe within that hotel to suit the overall positioning. So. For me, maturity, positioning, and the topic. The next topic is your next question. <laughs> and a quick one that's not on the list, but it strikes me that as we talk here, it's very easy for this to fall into lifestyle and luxury. Is there mid-scale and economy brands that this is relevant to as well? Absolutely. Absolutely. There's a lot. As a, as a matter of fact, previous speakers on this, on this stage, that's exactly where we're positioning the business. It's, it's about affordability, it's about value, it's about engagement, it's about belonging. Um, and this is really where people are kind of frequenting two, three times a week. I think uh, it's fine food rather than fine dining. This is what people are looking at. It's fine experiences rather than fine dining. People want fun that life. fun engagement and uh, theater of some sort. And, and you should not forget, if you look at cities like Dubai, London, Paris, there are thousands and thousands of restaurants in those cities, right? So there's a huge mix. And I sometimes feel we, have, we should have a responsibility to say, look, if you want to attract customers to come into your hotels, you have to be part of that huge mix, but have these uh, points of attraction that bring customers in. And I guess we've all, all involved in third-party partnerships here, right? So what makes a, for a great third-party partnership? Look, one, one, I think the third-party partnership, no matter what it is, if it's a brand or an owner, I think it's making sure objectives are aligned from the onset because you can't fix them later. From the onset, you need to make sure that objectives are aligned and he or she uh, will add value to your business and vice versa. Otherwise, if it's an amazing deal, someone's going to miss out and they will wake up one fine day and will start bickering. So partnerships are all about longevity and partnerships for me are all about a win-win. Otherwise, they're not sustainable. So it's understanding the market. And again, what we do in the UK as Gates and what we do in Oman is very different based on market maturity, based on competition and based on what the audience actually want. I totally agree. I think it needs to be win, 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 win. Win for them, win for us, win for the owners and win for the guests as well. You know? And I think that's always an important co component is thinking as a guest. And, you know, as a hotel guest or somebody from outside coming in, does it add value? You know, are we just cannibalizing ourselves by opening another restaurant that uh, is targeting exactly the same clientele, or are we doing, doing something different that brings a different type of clientele into the place? Okay, so when you get those four wins in, then you know, you're, you're in a good place. I, I would say it's, that's very important, but the other important aspect is communication. It's, and that probably forms part of it, right? But if you don't talk, like you only call yourself once or each other once for Christmas, it's not going to work. <laughs> You need to have continuous communication, understand what's happening, how are they performing, what are things that they might like to see improved, what are the things that we would like to see different. And this communication, especially in our industry, it's almost like a spider web of connections. If you know someone here, they have a connection to someone there, and I've, I've, I find it's very interesting because the way we, or in my case, I approach different markets, I speak to people who have already worked in other locations and they may know someone who is in that location and can tell us more about the industry and the people that are actively engaged in the communities. And I think that's a very important aspect to maintain that communication and say, look, we are, we're here, we want to partner, it's working well or it's not working well. And sometimes you need to have honest conversation when it's not working well, it's equally important. And I guess on that point, I mean, these things don't always work out, right? So what are the, what, it, when it doesn't work out, why, why else? Communication is one thing. Is there anything else that you guys see as being a kind of core, core challenge? Look, alignment, I think, again, I'll go back to my alignment word, is, is making sure that whoever the partner is understands uh, the culture that you're operating in, the space you're operating in, and the audience. Because a lot of the times when we bring brands in, when we bring partners in, um, they are operating in a different mindset. They are operating in a different frame of um, knowledge. 
So it's all about making sure that if they can't actually deliver, and I think we heard it earlier on stage as well, is I think there are many ways to run a business. You keep the brand above the door and someone else will operate it. You change the, the leadership team, you change the, the, the direction, but I think what's very essential here is to make sure that the market doesn't feel any of these kind of turbulences and um, challenges. Otherwise, in markets like the UAE, there's no forgiveness. Once a place doesn't do well, and we've seen it, no matter where you are, that place just does not succeed. I guess I've worked on a dozen or so of these types of collaborations, and I reckon that we've seen two or three questionably fail. And I, in my experience, one of the big challenges is getting traditional hotel operating teams who aren't necessarily involved from the outset. So with a new build, and of course that's very easy, your opening GM and your opening ops team get it retrospectively doing it becomes quite a challenge. And I think that that, that operational friction, I, I see, is a, is a major challenge. Uh, traditionally, time. hotel GM ships felt uncomfortable. Third parties coming in, taking a little bit of their hotel to operate it. Uh, that's, changed. that's changing. And I think the onus is really is uh, on us to keep the educational process, to keep making sure that they see the results commercially, they see the results from a positioning, from a marketing, sales, um, and vibrancy of, of the actual heartbeat of the actual unit. So it's changing, and I think it's being driven by asset management, by ownership, by even operators themselves. They realize that there is a vacuum. And realistically, a lot of the GMs, with all due respect to my colleagues in the, in the, in the room, haven't actually had the experience of wellness and or running an FMB. It's a different mindset. It's a different speed. It's a different agility level, different, uh, and that needs to be taken into account day in, day out. You can't do the traditional sales and marketing, press releases, because by the time they reach the audience, the next best place is stolen that space. It's a different, complete different business. Yes, and I think you know, running an independent restaurant compared to running a traditional hotel restaurant is Again, two different industries almost completely. The, uh, you know, and it comes from staffing first, and I think that's you know an essential part, and I think something that's always underlooked, looked, and you know, and, and that makes a difference. You know, your your teams are revenue generators. If you have the right people talking to you and selling you the, the right dish, you're gonna you know you're gonna generate a lot of money. And a lot of hotels are still blocked on that component where. Uh, we've done a market study. This is what the, what's the pay scale in hotels. Let's see, let's keep it that way. And that's you know that's not the right approach. Which and I think by changing a little bit all of the, those mindset, understanding that yes, it's great when we do 45% uh, end of uh, GOP, but that's not a traditional. You know that's not the first objective. If uh, the first objective is to actually really get those guests, you know, inside those seats, make them enjoy themselves, and then the rest will come naturally if you if you're successful in that sense. We've got a couple of minutes left. I'd really like to be able to give some people some tangible examples to go and either look at or search or whatever it is you want to do. So maybe start with you, Tobias. What should people go and look at as a great example of this working well? Look, I think everyone is here during the conference. So one of the great examples we have at this hotel is the uh, McCafferty's Irish Pub. Um, opened about three months ago and it was a restaurant where we had 30, 40 people coming in and saying the size, it's too large, um, it's, it's, it's not directly connected to the main road, I can't make it work. And McCafferty's came in and we, we toured the space and they said, the space is too small, can we add a second floor? And it was a remarkable day because in the end we, we signed this deal with them in, in partnership with Mural and the hotel and what's, what's amazing is we get a call nowadays and the owners are saying they're so happy. Do you have other sites where we can expand? They, on a normal Saturday, Sunday, they have six, seven hundred bookings to come to an Irish pub. And I think that's, that's a remarkable story. I'd love every, for everyone to, to have a look at it here. But they shipped three containers of authentic Irish um, designs and materials from Ireland here. They built everything with Irish builders and it's a, just a great product and you, you step in, you don't feel like you're in the Hilton and Yes Island, but you, <laughs> you feel you're in an, Irish, in an Irish pub environment and I think it's, it's phenomenally successful and we were very happy with this partnership. Amazing, thank you. Look forward to seeing it this afternoon. Over to you, Nick. Uh, well, for us it's a little bit different, of, of course, and again, it depends on the region. And I would say, you know, in Doha with the Morimoto, we have a very good partnership uh, at the Mondrian that's been going on for multiple years and, you know, been benefic beneficial for both parties. Here it's a little bit different. We do smaller partnerships. We don't, you know, again, we don't, we didn't bring yet any third-party operator in, in one of our properties. I think it's something that we're 
always considering, but we've done smaller partnership and you know, again, it doesn't have to be necessarily with other operators. We've done a partnership with Paul Anner, the beer here for Ernst, our, beer, our German beer garden. We've done a partnership with Dario Cicchini or you know, a butcher with, for Karna. Uh, so we're looking at you know, different options and, uh, and you know, there's, there's no only one solution, right? There, there's not one, one key element that, uh, you know, it's, it's very specific per area, per, you know, are you a resort, are you a city hotel, what, you know, what's your target audience? There's so many components, I don't, you know, if there was only one answer, there wouldn't be anybody sitting here, they would all be counting their money somewhere else and, uh, and, and it would be all good. So, well, you know, it's really about adapting to, to, to each uh, specific place. Uh, again, I'm often asked out of my 12 venues in Dubai, which one is my favorite? The, the answer is always depends who's around the table, depends what the event is, depends what we're doing. F for me, if you take Reform Social and Grill, uh, an amazing gastropub that really has put the gastropubs uh, on the map in the UAE. And uh, I remember pre-opening, our PR agency said to me, they said, are you sure you want to use the word gastropub? That's not something that we use in this part of the world. This is 12 years ago. This is not that far ago. Uh, if you take Folly, again, when it comes to food, the only independent, Michelin, Gomilo, 50 Best, Bistro Desart, very authentic. So all of our brands, what we have insisted on doing, what I really cherish is uh, authenticity at every level, from food, from beverage, from pricing, and engagement factor. So it depends what the, uh, the, the appetite's like. Uh, in London, what we have done, we've gone with Jeffrey Chowdhury out of Asia de Cuba. We have Red Farm there. So again, depends on the market. Uh, and what the market is doing in that current space, this is where we come in. So that answer was, you're not allowed to have a favourite child, right? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think on that note, thank you very much to my panel. Uh, it's been an incredible few minutes. Uh, big round of applause. <laughs>